What's up? Welcome back. You're looking at example number four here, uh, or practice problem number four for uh, drawing shear force diagrams and bending moment diagrams for various beams subject to various types of loads. So in this case, we have a couple point loads, distributed load, kind of starting and stopping at random places along the beam. And this is a cantilever beam. So this will differ from the last couple examples because we're going to get a reaction moment here we'll call that MA, which means that the internal moment right here on the left-hand side, uh, the internal bending moment will not be zero like it was with simply supported beams because it's basically going to be resisting whatever that is. Uh, you'll see that once we draw the free body diagrams. So we also have vertical reaction here. It's gonna be AY. And uh, it turns out that AY is equal to 80 kilonewtons and MA is equal to 400 kilonewton meters. So now we can set up our shear force diagram and bending moment diagram with our grid lines there for every time we have a notable point, which would be a point load or the start or stop or change in a uh, distributed load. So what we want to do now is we want to draw our shear force. Uh, for our shear force diagram, we want to draw our free body diagram here, uh, starting at the left hand side, moving to the right. And we're going to take our first virtual cut just to the right of the reaction here. So we have 80 kilonewtons pressing up. And then we're going to have our internal sh internal shear force. Um, we could draw on, for a proper free body diagram, we could draw on our internal moment here of 400 kilonewton meters. But what I'm gonna do right now is just going to do the analysis for the sum of forces in the y direction because that's all we need to get the shear. Uh, we're not really concerned with the moments just yet. We'll come back to that in a second when we start off our bending moment diagram. So. For some of forces in the y direction, the internal shear has to be 80 kilonewtons pressing down just to the right of the support. And where we're pressing down uh, with a shear force pressing down to the right of a virtual cut like this, that means it's a positive value. So that means we're going to be starting off at a positive value of 80 kilonewton meters. Let's change to blue, 80. Uh, and then, so this will be actually constant all the way up until just to the left of this because there's nothing changing in this region. So we'll throw a horizontal line there and we'll label this as 80. All right, cool. Uh, when we move across to uh, the just to the right-hand side, we're gonna extend this free body diagram so that it goes from here just to the right of this. That means we have to add on that uh, 20 kilonewtons pressing down. So if we have 80 going up and 20 going down, that means that we have to have 60 going down for our sum of forces in the y direction to sum out to zero. So basically we're going to drop down to 60. So just 80 minus 20, boom, something kind of like that. All right, so we'll just connect those. And then we'll label that, that is 60 kilonewtons. So that is the shear in this region, positive 60. Okay, so now we're at our next section. Uh, just if we extend our free body diagram just to the right of the section, uh, an infinitesimally small distance over, uh, we'll be including an infinitesimally small distributed load, which is basically zero, so it's not going to jump or anything like that just to the right of this. But we will be experiencing this uh, um, distributed load basically affecting our shear as we go through it. So let's extend our free body diagram just to the left of this point load, which means we're going to have to include two meters worth of 10 kilonewtons per meter distributed load. So we'll just throw that on. It doesn't have to be super pretty, but uh, that will be a total of 20 kilonewtons. So when we do that, we have 20 going down from the distributed load, 20 going down from this point load. We haven't, we're just on the left of this point load for a virtual cut, so we're not considering that one yet. And then we have 80 going up, so that's just going to bring us down uh, to 40 for that balance. That's going to have to be 40 pressing down, which will be positive still. So it's going to bring us to about there. Uh, and then we'll label that on as 40 kilonewtons. All right. If we look just to the right, if we extend our free body diagram just to the right of this point load, that basically means we're going to be adding on that extra 20 kilonewtons pressing down. It's going to give us 60 down, 80 up, which is going to mean that our internal shear will drop down to a positive 20. So we're going to be down halfway there, just like that, and that's going to be positive 20 kilonewtons. And then if we extend our free body diagram from the left all the way to the right, uh, we're going to have to include two, uh, 2 meters times 10 kilonewtons per meter more on the distributed load, so we're just going to update that 20 to a 40 and we're gonna be ending with zero. Well, if we have 40 down, 20, 20, 
that's 80 down, 80 up, we're going to be ending with our internal shear force at zero right at the end of the free end of the cantilever beam. And as always, we should check for the free body diagram from the other side of the beam. So if we were to draw uh, basically the free body diagram of the end, just, just to the left of this, the distributed load would be infinitesimally small because this, uh, this width here is infinitesimally small and there's no point load acting here. Um, so we would expect definitely that basically if the distributed load is zero, then the internal shear would also have to match up being zero there. So that looks like we've done that correctly. All right, so now let's look at our bending moment diagram. In this case, we're gonna be taking, again, let's inspect this with a free body diagram uh, that's taken just with a virtual cut just to the right of this support. So we do know that we had that 80 kilonewtons pressing up. We had that internal shear of 80 kilonewtons going down and that we know we have this applied moment here, or this reaction moment acting on the beam uh, going like this. So we have that is a 400 kilonewton meters acting in that counterclockwise sense. Well, when we, so this, we know that we're going to have a, an internal moment in the beam. And if you look at the force couple here, 80 kilonewtons uh, up and 80 kilonewtons down, we're taking this virtual cut, this distance here, uh, let's call this dx, this distance is infinitesimally small because we're taking this cut as close to the support as we can basically imagine. Uh, so as this distance tends towards zero, the moment that's caused by this force couple is basically tending towards zero. So this is not contributing to our moment, to our internal moment. So the only thing that we have that's contributing to the internal moment uh, this close to the wall is this 400 kilonewton meter. So that means that for static equilibrium, uh, we need to have a 400 kilonewton meter moment going in the clockwise sense uh, for our internal bending moment. Now when we look at our positive sign convention, where we're to the right of a virtual cut, we consider this counterclockwise moment to be positive. We have a clockwise moment to the right of a cut. So this is actually considered a negative bending moment. So we're going to drop this down right here. We're going to call this negative 400. This is our bending moment just to the right of this cut. Now from here, we don't really want to get in the habit of, uh, of doing our bending moments in terms of x the whole way across because that is a very time consuming process. So from here, we know our starting point. Now we're going to use the same method as we were doing in the previous videos where we just take the area of the shear force diagram as the change in magnitude on the bending moment diagram. And again, where this is a horizontal line, we get a linear change. Where this is a, a sloped line, we get a parabolic change. And where this is on this area is positive, if that change is uh, on the bending moment diagram is tending towards the positive direction. And if there was a negative area, then the, uh, then the bending moment diagram change in magnitude would go towards the negative side. But all of these areas are on the positive side, so our bending moment is going to continue going upwards here as we go from left to right. So looking at this first section in here, we take the area of this base times height. Uh, the base is 2 meters, the height is 80 kilonewtons, so we're getting a change in magnitude of 160 kilonewton meters. So that's going to bring us from negative 400 up to negative 240. And we, uh, it's a straight line here, it's a horizontal line, so that's going to give us a linear change in magnitude as we go across. Um, looking at the next one here, 60 times 2, so that's 2 meters times 60 kilonewtons. That's a change in magnitude on the bending moment diagram of 120 kilonewton meters, or an area here of 120 kilonewton meters. So 240, we're going to add 120 going in the positive direction, so that's going to take us down to negative 120 kilonewton meters. And again, that was a horizontal line on the shear force diagram, so we get this linear change. Uh, across the bending moment diagram between those two regions. All right, looking at this next section here, um, we have actually a composite area. We're going to be like that. If you can see, it's a triangle and a rectangle. So when we go, we have to calculate both of these together. So the area of the triangle is going to be one half base height. So one half times two meters times the height of the triangle, which is 60 minus 40. That's going to be 20 kilonewtons. And uh, that's uh, this half and two is going to cancel out. So the area of the triangle is going to be 20 kilonewton meters. And then the area of the rectangle is just going to be base times height. So 
the base is 2 meters times the height, which is uh, 40 kilonewtons, so that's going to be 80. And then when we add those two together, we get the total area of this composite shape to be 100 kilonewton meters. So that's going to bring us from negative 120, it's going to push us 100 units in the positive direction because of this positive area. And that's going to bring us basically here to, uh, maybe I'll write it down here, to minus 20. Now this is a, uh, this is a sloped line on the shear force diagram. So this region in here is actually, let me attempt to draw it. It's not going to be straight, but it is going to be a parabolic change. And then when we look at the last section in here, this is just an area of a triangle, so it's going to be 1 half times base times height. Again, base is 2 meters, height is 20 kilonewtons. Uh, that should be a 2, not a B. Uh, so this is just going to be a total area of 20 kilonewton meters. That is the change in magnitude from here to here as we go right. And that is going to go from minus 20 just to zero and actually got a little carried away with myself there. This is also a sloped line. And so we're getting this parabolic curvature coming in there, ending us right at zero. Now often if you're doing this on paper or in an exam, typically your bending moment diagrams and stuff are going to be all squished and compressed like this just because you'll physically be limited by the paper that you're drawing on for this size. Um, so it's not a bad idea to label uh, these these regions in here so that your teacher, so they can show your teacher, even if you, they can't really tell that this is a parabola, parabolic, um, that uh, that you're just telling your teacher that, yeah, you understand what's going on here, um, that these regions are parabolic and these regions here are linear because uh, it, yeah, it just gets messy sometimes on exams. Um, but this is good to look at this often, uh, unless we have an applied moment right here at the very end of the uh, of a cantilever beam, that we should be expecting the bending moment here to be tending to zero as well. Um, so that's just good to know. It looks like we've done this problem correctly. Um, and again, just noting that where we have a fixed support, that um, your internal moment un is not going to be zero, unlike how we had uh, always zeros at the ends of simply supported beams where you have these rigid connections, you're going to be having some sort of internal bending moment. Um, all right, what else can we talk about? Uh, I think the last thing to say here is just your teacher, or your it might be part of the question that you're looking for the deflected shape. And in this case, again, uh, if you've been watching the last couple of videos, so far our deflected shape is not going to be anything exciting, it's just going to be bending down. Um, again, your professor is just looking to know that if, yeah, if we're pushing down on the top of a beam uh, and nothing's pushing back up at the bottom or there's no applied moments along the way, that yeah, this beam is going to be sagging down. And uh, basically, these, these deflected shapes are, are going to be pretty boring until we get into the overhanging beams where, uh, where we'll be getting uh, the bending moment crossing the axis and then we'll be getting inflection points and things like that. Um, but you guys will see that in the next couple of videos once we start talking about overhanging beams. But otherwise, thanks for watching this video, and I will see you guys in the next one.